almost a hundred years ago Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore said something very profound about agriculture as you know Tagore was the first non-European Nobel laureate not just the first Indian but when we talk of Tagore especially if you grew up in the south it's all about the poet, the knighthood, the paintings, Gitanjali. Actually, Tagore had many, many profound observations on socio-economic issues. And almost a hundred years ago, he said this. Food is a source of wealth. Food production is a source of endless misery. Food is a source of wealth, but food production is a source of misery. Those who produce the food, they don't have the wealth, they have misery. When, in fact, Tagore was so moved when he went into the Bengal countryside, saw the state of agriculture, he shifted out of Kolkata and settled in a rural area amidst a community of Adivasi farmers where he tried to start his world university, Vishwabharati. That was the impact that agriculture and the agrarian community had on Rabindranath Tagore, that he left the comfort of the city to stay amidst a community of Adivasi farmers. A hundred years later, that statement about food being a source of wealth, but food production being a source of misery, is such a prophetic one. Take the Arab Spring. Take the huge uprisings that took place in Egypt, Yemen, Syria, Tunisia. In 2008, there were food riots. In 2010, there were uprisings. The, the Arab Spring came. The Arab Spring did not happen because of Google or Twitter. Most of the people on the streets had neither, had no Twitter accounts or anything of the sort or Facebook pages. That might have facilitated communication. But all these countries, ever since 2008, including India, had seen giant increases in food prices. In Egypt, the price of the most basic bread that Egyptians consume went up by 85%. Employment, unemployment was running at 40% and about 70% amongst youth. Now, as food prices went up all over the world, even when the stock market collapsed in Wall Street, one group of companies did very well. Food and agriculture related companies continued to make super profits. All in the very year that the Arab Spring took place, 2010, early 2010, which is the consequence of events in 2009, if you look at Fortune, Fortune magazine, the great business magazine, you know, everyone knows Fortune 500, the top 500 companies. But Fortune has another list. It's called the Fortune list of fastest growing companies and most profitable companies. In 2009, at a time when food riots were occurring all over the world, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, when food riot, when Western Mark, when Western societies were worrying about food prices, in the, in the fortune list of the top 10 profit-making companies, 2009, four of the top 10 were food companies. Cargill, Archer Daniels, Midland, all the usual suspects. They were first they, they rank the food related companies rank number one by profit and number four by revenue. They were at the top of the world 
when the world was really hungry at that time i understood something that was troubling me all these years of covering agriculture the two greatest crops in the world are not wheat and rice the two greatest crops in the world are hunger and thirst and the harvesting of that hunger and thirst is what corporate agriculture does is what corporate profit does is what a corporate driven society does the two greatest crops in the world are hunger and thirst it's not for any it's not an accident that the west wants you to shift completely to growing cash crop to growing sugar cane cotton vanilla safed museli whatever cash crop that will make you ever more dependent on them for food okay and in the last 20 years of the liberalization era we have shifted nobody knows how many acres of land from food crop to cash crop not very far from here is the district of vayanad in kerala what does vayanad mean vayal nadu the land of paddy you find me 10 acres of paddy in vayanad it's all cash crop there is no paddy left vayal nadu is actually vanilla nadu rubber nadu and tea nadu and coffee all cash crop cash crop agriculture is controlled agricultural commodities are controlled by half a dozen corporations at the global level yeah. but coming back to tagore statement of food production another explosive issue at the global level as corporations have taken over agriculture one as i said food companies were amongst the highest profit making companies in the world in the year of the arab uprising in the years of um, in the years of food riots in countries the food and agriculture organization of the united nations has an index called the food prices index and researchers noticed something very interesting in 2011 some research done on the food prices index of the fao showed that whenever the index crossed 210 the likelihood of food riots was much higher whenever the index crossed 210 the likelihood of violence and food riots driven by hunger was much higher in 2010 the index crossed 210 and you saw the arab spring in 2008 it crossed 210 and you saw the food riots in tunisia yemen all of which had once been self sufficient in cereals in the 70s all of which had done much of shifting to cash crop okay so you have this as one uh, as one situation um uh, in the old biblical saying as you shall sow so shall you reap but today you don't sow what you want to sow somebody else takes that decision somebody else decides what you will sow you don't reap what you sow because somebody else harvests your crop you don't even consume what you sow because someone else consumes what you sow in the 90s when i was visiting farm households in this country in chatisgarh in sarguja in maharashtra in vidarbha when i entered a farm household in the early 90s the first thing i would be greeted with in tamil nadu in in in, in this state if you entered a, you would be given a glass of fresh milk in a silver glass they would have one silver glass it was a reflection of 
status and respect and everything else they would give you a silver glass small silver tumbler with milk by the late 90s the milk became chai by two th- by by the late by even by, by the turn of the century the silver tumbler disappeared it came in cracked cups and saucers by 2004 it was black chai no milk millions of children growing up on farms in this country do not drink milk because any milk that is produced on the farm is sold to buy other necessities for the family okay first it started with a silver tumbler with fresh milk then it became a cup then the tumbler went away then the milk went away black chai is what you get now in many of the households because they really do not have milk how did all of us grow up thinking of farmers with we associated a farm household with milk go and look today how much milk the farmer's child consumes almost nothing in many cases nothing uh you know historically also when we speak of the arab spring please remember egypt was once the bread basket of the roman empire egypt was the bread basket of the roman empire today egypt is a basket case many changes took place in agriculture under colonialism then there was a reversal after colonialism and a re-reversal under structural adjustment and world bank and imf and wto and western pressure as more and more of our countries in the name of earning hard currency shifted to making crops for export not for consumption the classic example which affected mangalore is vanilla this district is affected by vanilla in 2003 v- vanilla prices were so high 100 dollars per kilogram not quintal 100 dollars per kilogram many of my friends in kerala shifted from whatever they were doing to vanilla i was very alarmed and i said this will not last this will this is a fraud you are being taken for a ride because the us vanilla association of federation was offering phenomenal prices because there had been a shortfall in mexico and brazil or wherever else but immediately in vyanad and elsewhere and of course our media played it up like anything every second cover of karshagashri was meet vanilla crorepati so everybody thought he is going to be a crorepati so many people thousands of farmers shifted to vanilla and if i argued with them i had no argument because they showed me 4000 rupees per kilogram in 4000 rupees in 2003 was Hundred dollars. What is the price of vanilla per kilogram now? When I looked last, it was some sixty-eight or eighty-two rupees, according to the variety. What a collapse! Hmm? This happens to all. Half a dozen corporations control the prices at the global level. Half a dozen. That is the global picture. But now come to India and what has happened with farming, with agriculture. with farmers the what there are spectacular figures coming out of the 2011 census you know and it shows you how stupid some of your so called eminent economists are some of you have followed this so called debate between jagdish bhagwati and uh, panagriya attacking professor amartya sen in fact they say that agriculture is doing so well the farm suicides are a myth this is what they have written in their book last book farm suicides are a myth professor bhagwati says and why does he say that you know how many farmers have committed he does not deny the number of farmers who have committed suicide he does not deny that hmm? 2 lakh 85000 farmers in this country have committed suicide since 1995 according to the national crime records bureau that is the official figure 
I use this figure though it is a fake. It excludes very large numbers of women farmers who have committed suicide because they are not recognized as farmers. They don't have land in their name. It excludes very large numbers of Dalit and Adivasi farmers because their titles and their pattas are not clear. Okay. But let, even then, what a horrendous figure 285,000 is. Do you know what the eminent economists of Columbia University, Jagdish Bhagwati and Arvind Panagriya, whom I call Don Bhagwati and Sancho Panagriya, you know what they wrote? They said, this is a very they say this is a very trivial this is a very trivial figure yeah they say this is a very trivial figure because 53 percent of indians are farmers therefore the suicide rate is very small if you if you take it against what is the suicide rate suicide rate is number of number of farmers who commit suicide per hundred per hundred thousand farmers the student suicide rate would be number of students who commit suicide per hundred thousand students. Okay. So they say, look, the number of farmers in the country is 53% and they actually, they actually write this disgusting line in their book. In fact, farmer suicide rate is so healthy, so low, we should attempt to bring the rest of the society to the level of the farmer's suicides. Now here is a pair of eminent economists who do not know who a farmer is in the country. Nor do they know who, they are not denying the figure, huh? they are saying it's insignificant. 2,85,000 suicides is insignificant. In that case, the Bhopal gas tragedy is trivial. 20,000 people died in Bhopal gas tragedy. That is less than 0.03% of the population. Should we take it seriously? Do you take the death of people in Bhopal non-seriously because they are a small percentage of the population? Anyway, leave that. Leave the morality of it aside. They have none. So let's leave that aside. Let's take the facts. The idea that 53%, as I said, you would think, I can, I can understand people like you and me, lay persons, not knowing who a farmer is. But here are these economists with multiple degrees, you know, who don't know who an Indian farmer is. And also don't know who counts farmer suicides. Hmm? In the definition of the census. Now, they don't know the difference between being engaged with the farming sector and being a farmer. Everybody in agriculture is not a farmer. Everybody in Bollywood is not an actor. In fact, actors are the smallest percentage of Bollywood. The smallest section of Bollywood are actors, but they are larger than life. Do I have to convince you that everybody in Bollywood is not an actor? That it's a huge industry in which actors are... A... Everybody in the education sector is not a teacher or a student. How many millions of people are involved in the education sector who are neither teachers nor student? Likewise, 53% of the Indian population may be dependent on agriculture, may be engaged in one way or other with agriculture, but they are not farmers. How does the census of India define a cultivator? How does the census of India define a farmer? In the census, there are multiple divisions of agrarian society, but three basic, you know that census divides the population into workers and non-workers. Non-workers are students, children, retired people, pensioners, leave that aside. Workers are dis divided into main worker and marginal workers. Sometimes you can have further subdivisions in marginal workers. Me who is a main worker? A main worker in agriculture, a main worker, they, they call it cultivator, main worker, 
is someone who has spent 183 days of the year on that occupation. That means you have spent at least half the year doing that. When you have spent half the year doing farming, it means that you are dependent on farming. If you have spent 20 days working on the farm, you are not dependent on farming. If you have spent 60 days working on the farm, you are not dependent on, but if you have spent half the year, you are clearly dependent on farming. So then they have marginal cultivators, which is less than 100, 100 to 100 and, you know, three months to six months, the marginal cultivators. Okay? Three months, under six months, maybe three months, and then there are some who are under three months also. So you understand the full-time farmer is actually, the full-time farmer, this is not my definition, it's the census. Me, I think that everybody who works the land should be recognized as a farmer. That is my, my understanding. But in the census of India, the main worker cultivator is the farmer. And that cultivator, main worker, any guesses what percentage of the population it is? Anyone wants to guess what is the percentage of actual full-time farmers who work at least half the year on farming? Sorry? Less than 8%. And it has been falling consistently since the neoliberal economic reforms. Okay? In fact, if you look at the 1991 census, 1981 to 91, the number of farmers went up. It actually went up, not just because, not because of prosperity, but because of subdividing of land, fragmentation of land, all these reasons, the number of cultivators went up. Okay? Then, but 91 to 2001, there is a fall of 7.3 to 7.4 million farmers less in 2001 than there were in, 2000, in 1991. 2011 census has 7.7 .7 million farmers less than 2001. That means between, uh, if you take, compare 2011 to, 2000, to 1991, in those 20 years, there are 15 million fewer people classified as full-time cultivators, as main cultivators. You know what that means? It means on average, every day, there are 2,000 fewer farmers in this country. 2,000 fewer farmers every day, even if you just take the period from 2001 to 2011. 7.7 .7 million, you divide by 365 days, see what you get. Now, what has happened? What has happened to these farmers? Many of them have fallen from the rank of farmers and become agricultural laborers. If you look at the census, state by state, except for three states the where the number of farmers have gone up, cultivate, which for very interesting reasons, cultivators have gone up. But in Andhra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, all these places, number of Farmers has collapsed, number of agricultural laborers has trebled. That means a lot of people who were once farmers have lost the status of being farmers and become agricultural laborers. Perhaps become laborers on their own land, what was once their own land. My home state of Andhra Pradesh is the classic example. Compared to 2001 census, there are 1.3 million fewer farmers in Andhra Pradesh today than there were in 2001. But you know something? Agricultural laborers have gone up by three and a half million. Agricultural laborers have risen by three and a half million. So you know where the misery is going. Apart from which, you've had 
nearly 3 lakh suicides in 15 years something terrible has happened in the countryside 2000 fewer farmers a day on average more and more agricultural laborers farming is on its knees now coming back to your 20% figure you can arrive at a figure of 20% i'll show you how the full time farmer main worker is 7.8% if i add marginal farmers that is those who work 3 to 6 months 3 months 4 months in the year on farming even then the figure comes to less than 10% even then the figure comes to less but if i then add all landless laborers agricultural laborers whom i consider farmers but that's not how it is officially defined they are landless farmers agricultural laborers agricultural workers main workers marginal workers you add all these categories it will come to 22 23% of the population and here are two economists who talk of 53% of the population being farmers you know they write since in one line they write 53% of the indian population is engaged in farming fine the next line they write since 53% of the indian indians are farmers the suicide ratio is very small they have no distinction between engaged with farming and farmer they are making the ball everybody in bollywood is an actor mistake fallacy hmm? that is how they are arriving at that figure what is the suicide rate amongst farmers let me tell you what the suicide rate amongst uh, that, but but first to tell you who decides whether a suicide is a farm suicide or not i have been present at dozens and dozens of instances where the police have arrived to make a determination sometimes when the government is upset tehsildar will also come who are the people who make this determination whether a suicide is a farmer suicide or a non farmer suicide police our eminent economists don't know census counts farmers police counts suicides police do not read census police want to know they say you i have had this argument over the non classification of baby thai doke a woman farmer in akola i had this fight with the tehsildar or the deputy tehsildar and the police we had this argument with them why have you not recorded her patta dikhao show the patta where her name is she is the farmer of that household her husband has tb he is infirm he has not done physical work for 25 years marutra doke she was the farmer she cracked under the strain the last season she pawned her mangal sutra for input costs she grew something again it got wiped out by excess rain it got wiped out by excess rain baby thai doke killed herself when we went to her place her 13th day rites were being performed with the money that had been got from pawning the mangal sutra her last rites were being pawned with that money huh? and they said no she is not a farmer because the land is in her husband's name thousands and thousands of women farmers are excluded from the farm suicides list using this trick <laughs> let me tell you this very interesting thing see it it has a lot to do with our society which does not recognize women's work in anything let alone agriculture but especially in agriculture where 67% of work is done by women in paddy transplantation 99% 100% of work is done by women in seeding 76% of work is done by women we have studies that shows this but they won't be counted as farmers because their name will not be on the patta it will be in the husband's name father's name brother's name something like that so since society will not give them the recognition as farmers the police are also part of that society they are not going to take an enlightened view they are not going to read census chapter on usages and definitions they are not going to read all this they are going to say is her name has she got land in her name if she doesn't have land so 
in a period of nearly 3 lakh suicides number of women farmer suicides is very low because they won't be counted here is the wonderful thing if we go by the official data which I do alas I have no other source the best place in the world to be a woman farmer is Haryana there has never been a woman farmer suicide they burn them alive also but they are not farmers so year after 7-8 years in the last 18 years of data Punjab and Haryana have repeatedly filed zero under women farmer suicides but the same Punjab and Haryana if you look at general suicides the number of women suicides is shooting up it's going up very heavily very high but they basically they're not big women farmers are not being counted as farmers so the actual number of women farmer suicides is much higher than what is reflected in the NCRB data hmm. now another trick has started because I did this, it's my fault having written all these figures and shown what how bad even this bloody official figure is so bad it tells us the official figure of 285,000 if I take it from 2001 it tells us that in this country every half an hour every 30 minutes a farmer kills himself or herself so even this horrible official figure even this bogus figure is bad imagine how bad the real figures would be now you have many other groups also excluded from the list and still you come to this 285,000 figure for your information two-thirds of the farmers suicides are in five states in five states and the second worst state in the country is Karnataka 39,000 farmers suicides since 1995 Maharashtra is number one with 57,000 plus suicides Karnataka is second with about 39,000 suicides Andhra Pradesh is third with 36,000 suicides and then come Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh overwhelmingly the suicide committing farmers are cash crop farmers overwhelmingly they are cash crop farmers why uh, who are these why very few very few food crop farmers commit suicide at the end of the day whatever the price whatever the collapse you can still eat your paddy you cannot eat cotton you cannot eat unprocessed sugar cane you cannot eat vanilla the shifting one of the major achievements of neoliberal economics in this country was to shift lakhs and lakhs of peasants from food crop production to cash crop production that is one huge change that took place in agriculture the second is as as there is more and more cash crop agriculture there is greater and greater domination of corporations because you are producing entirely for export not for consumption everything please look at agriculture today every sector of agriculture but one every sector of agriculture is is controlled by corporations except direct land ownership except direct land ownership and the act of daily cultivation which sector of agriculture is controlled by the farmer is water controlled by the farmer no and water is being privatized state after state huh? they create all sorts of water users associations I love that word as if the rest of us are dry land bacteria water users every every creature in this planet uses water the creatures of the desert use water what is a water users association that is the entire humanity uh, in Nagpur, Chandrapur in several cities of this country distribution of water has already been handed over to private corporations okay but this trivializing of the farmers problem this trivializing it is there not only by stupid economists who don't know who a farmer is it's also there amongst journalists and media when 
when in 2007 for the first time uh, I should tell you that the I, I should mention here that the person who really put the data together for the first time for the first time who really analyzed the data and made me understand it is an economist from Karnataka K. Nagaraj who worked for 30 years at the Madras Institute of Development Studies. He is from Udipi, Udipi uh, district. He is the first person to put together a picture of what happened in this country in 15 years. When we put that figure together in 2007, the Nagpur Union, Vidarbha Union of Journalists was felicitating me for something or the other, some award. And one of the journalists with 25 years experience, a man who is living in Vidarbha, stands up and says, yeah, yeah, Mr. Sainath, we know all this stuff, but you know, uh, these fellows, they commit suicide because they're all drunkards, no? I said, you know, the problem with that argument, then alcoholism may be a factor, but if every drunkard commits suicide, there would be no journalists left in the world. <laughs> and very few human rights activists. And very few academics also. Hmm. Then, the, anyway, we put this figure together, it shows what is the rate, what is the suicide rate. Now, in 2011, when we had two census, one 2001 and 2011, I asked Nagraj to compare the suicide rate. In suicide rate in 2011 for farmers, is marginally higher than it was at the peak in 2001. Second, how does it compare to non-farmers? So Dr. Nagaraj divided the population into farmer, non-farmer. The rate of suicide amongst farmers is 47% higher than amongst non-farmers in this country. If we come to the five states, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Chhattisgarh, Andhra Pradesh. An Andhra farmer is three times more likely to kill himself than any other Indian who is not a farmer. In Chhattisgarh, he is five times more likely to kill himself than any Indian who is not a farmer. In Karnataka, he is twice as, more, twice as likely to kill himself as any Indian who is not a farmer. This is how terrible the suicide rates are. Okay. So that is the stage of farm suicides. But the agrarian crisis is much larger. But I come back to the point I made. Which sector of agriculture is controlled by the farmer? Not water. Does he control seed? No. Three, four, one company controls all the seed in cotton. Does the farmer control pesticide? No. Five or six companies control the pesticide market in this country and in the world. Does the farmer control marketing? He doesn't control the marketing. Huh. It is your traders who control and corporations who control a Birla Agro and ICICI. These are the people who control the market linkages. Does the farmer control the mandi? He doesn't traders control that. Does the farmer control the input costs of his cultivation? He doesn't. Does he control the cost of electricity which Mr. Chandrababu Naidu raised 70% in a single year? And last year, in the last year, again Andhra Pradesh has raised power costs by nearly 80% in at one shot in, in the present regime. Okay. What then does the farmer control? In, in state after state in the country, farmers have asked me, when I, when I give a talk, and they say, why do you call us farmers? What do we control that makes us farmers? We are laborers. We are working on the field. We don't control anything in this process of farming. Why do you call us farmers? Hmm. So this is... Let's take what has happened under the neoliberal econom economy. As corporations control the input, costs go up. Costs go up like anything. Look, the cost of uh, agriculture 
you are paying mr mukesh ambani remember the gas price hike two months ago that is now working itself into prices okay the gas price hike gas is hugely used in the manufacture of fertilizer gas is hugely used in the manufacture of pesticide all prices connected to farming input costs will go up as corporations take control over agriculture the costs of cultivation are shooting through the roof when i first went to vidarbha in 2003 every every season i go back and i do the cost of one cultivating one acre of cotton irrigated one acre of cotton non irrigated in 2003 it cost 2500 rupees to cultivate one acre of non irrigated cotton in 2003 and it cost 10000 to 11000 rupees to cultivate one acre of irrigated land now i'm taking the upper cost because many people do it in less because they don't have a choice in 2012 november before the present price hike i haven't updated the data but if i compare to 2003 in 2012 november one acre of unirrigated cotton was 15000 to 18000 rupees one acre of irrigated cotton was 44000 rupees now the cost of cultivation has gone up five times has the farmer's income gone up five times hmm? so the price in the name of market based price which is not it's not controlled by market forces it is by political decision to reward mukesh ambani or tata or birla or anil ambani the kg gas price the krishna godavari basin gas price which resource does not belong to private companies but is a publicly owned resource is given to them for a song and then they are given a huge increase in price which the cag has attacked and criticized the entire process of allocation and everything else and of the um, gifts given to these people when all this has happened farming takes a huge hit in cultivation costs a massive hit in the cost of cultivation so your costs keep going up and as and as the government piles up more and more food grain in the in the uh, godowns and in the open because there are no godowns not enough so then food goes waste which could have been consumed by human beings who desperately need it the supreme court tells the prime minister please distribute the food grain in the hungry and the prime minister says it is none of your business the same prime minister who never says boo to a goose told the prime told the supreme court to get out in 2010 if you remember now that grain which could have been given to starving children is rotting it's gone you have the healthiest per capita rat population in the in the world hmm? now in that in that in the amount of grain in that amount of grain also remember that mr pawar stands up every year and says record production record production one year it is 240 million tons he will announce record production next year it is 240.5 million tons he will announce new record he will not tell you what the figure is per capita it has been declining sharply per capita sharply the daily per capita availability of food grain is today if you take 2005 to 2010 period it is less than it was in 2000 uh, in 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 2056 to it took yeah in 1956 to 1960 before the green revolution per capita availability the food grain available per india if you look at the 20 years before the economic reforms and you take five year averages five year averages in those 20 years every five year average shows an increase if you take the 20 years of the economic reforms every five year average shows a decrease now please remember that before the reforms period population was growing faster in this last two decades population growth has slowed has has slowed down dramatically 
half the country is below fertility replacement level which means that you are going to be facing a problem of declining population and older population only in the next 30 years all the southern states are below fertility replacement level which is 2.2 children per woman don't ask me how they manage such a calculation I have no idea how can you get 2.2 children is beyond me but but anyway so that is the that is the figure every de devastation every damage has been driven by policy look at the water policy of this country hmm? we are privatizing water on the one hand thousands tens of thousands of bottle comp bottling companies are coming grabbing water putting it into plastic bottle and charging you 12 rupees for now now 14 to 18 rupees per bottle depending on where you buy it okay like this so this is the uh, water situation every year you are having a drought or what they call a drought but which is a serious severe water crisis even when there is good rainfall because you are not recharging the surface of the earth you are not, you're not recharging the groundwater aquifer sorry you are not recharging the groundwater you are drawing out groundwater at a much faster pace than the recharge so even when there are good rains the recharge is about 10 to 30 percent of what was taken out if you have taken out three liters the recharge may be one liter so over the next 20 years you're looking at disaster on a scale unimaginable and in that time you are privatizing water so all these issues none of these issues when and then what happens you get people into the volatility of cash crop prices which are globally controlled coffee is controlled by four companies four corporations control coffee prices in the world that affects Karnataka very badly it affects what you do in Kurg, in Kutta it affects all your coffee uh, estates it affects Kerala, Tamil Nadu very badly 70% of our coffee, in, especially 70% of Kerala, 100% of Kerala's coffee is exported. Keralites grow coffee and drink tea. But I mean, there's no explaining it, but anyway. So, uh, there is no local market, like there is no local market for vanilla. When the vanilla price drops, hundreds of suicides were reported of vanilla farmers in Kerala. When the coffee prices drop, you have the same coffee and pepper farmers committing suicide overwhelmingly the suicides are by cash crop farmers the highest number being cotton farmers the condition of those they leave behind is so is, is in such total complete misery take if you go to Mandia district which is one of the worst districts for farmer suicides in Karnataka you can meet Jayalakshmamma who under the public distribution system law of Karnataka at the time was entitled to only 4 kgs at subsidized price per month because for a family of 5, 20 kgs she was alone because her children, one son had run away one girl is working in Bangalore so she is entitled to 4 kgs at subsidized rate incidentally the new food security bill also lowers the entitlement because later it went up to 35 kgs per family but now the food security bill brings it back to 25 kgs per family but what was very interesting about Jayalakshmama she is entitled to 4 kgs of rice per month at controlled prices she works 12 hours 15 hours as a manual laborer doing hard load work some agricultural labor work her own land she can't cultivate anymore she's given it out on lease at a very low rate she is entitled in your society in your country to 145 grams of rice per meal or sorry to 45 grams 145 grams per day 4 kilograms per month 30 days one hour's drive from Jayalakshmama's house is central jail Bangalore where a convict a person convicted of murder gets 710 grams of rice in his meal for free and 
he gets ragi also and he gets and he gets some wheat also she is entitled to 100 she is entitled to 45 grams per meal of subsidized wheat that is the inequality inherent in this entire process because all this is a result of the growing inequality from economic policies practiced for the last 20 years now as this process of corporatization grows the government tries to solve the problems that are coming out with further concessions to the corporate sector the latest some of you have heard of the joint venture ppp between corporations and government of india called million farmer initiative so you get excited million farmers being involved in the project you open the pages then i got the inside document from fiki government had one document fiki had another document what is the million farmer initiative in every state 20 or 30 major corporations have been allocated so many farmers so there are reliance farmers and tata farmers and itc farmers and birla farmers 7000 crore budget does not go to the farmers it goes to itc ambani and birla with 3500 direct subsidy going to these corporations from your money i think that you would not resent it if it went to the farmer it's not going to the farmer and they've given which crop will be grown where which what is the ppp what is the arrangement of this ppp these corporations will teach the farmers how to do agriculture so itc kolkata some mba from kolkata iim maybe or wharton school or wherever is come from executives of itc kolkata are going to teach farmers of southern tamil nadu how to grow ragi i'm not joking i am not joking that is actually written in the bloody document hmm? the crop that will be grown now the farmers of south tamil nadu have been growing ragi for 2000 years they have forgotten more about ragi than you and i will learn in our lifetime the money the power is being bestowed on the corporation more and more and more everything we do is being sold out to corporations in the last look at the media they are celebrating the fact that employees pensions will now be invested in the private sector markets in the in private markets do you know what the history of this has done in china in other countries you remember the falun gong movement in china where all those old people were protesting china said cia and everything else it was all old retirees whose pensions had got wiped out on the on the shanghai stock exchange by putting all their pensions in private funds for god sake those of you who are having pensions don't put them in private funds don't do that you are heading for another huge we were living on a bubble the rupee crash is not a surprise to many of us it's shocking but it's not a surprise how did you bring the rupee to this rate you brought the rupee to this rate by opening up and inviting lots of hot and speculative money which the moment there was 10 paisa better profit somewhere else they pulled out and they left now you are saying to bring them back we have to give more concessions and open up even more so that the volatility of your economy and your rupee will by the way the rupee will strengthen i'll tell you why it will strengthen till may 2014 it will go down a little now but you'll see in the next year there will be 3 months during which the rupee will strengthen considerably why elections all the hawala money will come in what was prime minister narasimha rao's great achievement when he came the official rate of the rupee was 17 rupees to the dollar the hawala rate was 34 when narsimha rao stepped down from prime ministership the official rate was 34 hmm? now so as the election period comes in and the hawala funds parked overseas come in the rupee will strengthen dollars will come everything things will strengthen a bit but in the middle of 2000 second half of 2014 you might even see disaster tomorrow i'm not i'm not pre- excluding the possibility but after 2014 you are going to see big trouble you know 
all in many of these countries where pension funds in the United States itself the savings and loan scandal and pension funds after the 2008 collapse many 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 people whose pension funds were invested in the market have been completely wiped out I would not like to see that happen to anyone here anyone at all anywhere so please do not celebrate this great idea no media tells you that left MPs in Parliament protested strongly and fought tooth and nail to stop the passage of this bill they don't even tell you that there was opposition to the bill they don't even tell you there was opposition they say it was passed they say food security bill was passed they don't tell you that the amount of grain per family is going to come down from 35 to 25 kgs that fewer people in Maharashtra the number of people who will be eligible now under the new food security bill is one crore less than those who are presently eligible for reduced prices for controlled prices so we are looking at disaster down there and yet the corporatization of agriculture continues worse and worse and worse <laughs> one economic policy two water policy three your fertilizer policy four your policies of credit in 2010 you could get you could buy a Mercedes Benz with 7% interest on the loan the same state bank of India that gave that loan was giving charging 14% interest on loan for tractor purchase so tractors were 14% and a Mercedes Benz was 7% because you are shoring up the private sector and luxury sector in all these fronts you have run into trouble <coughs> the intensity of farm suicides will in my opinion rise even though even if you control the numbers it's going to be terrible it's going to remain 40 percent higher than the rest of the country what do we do about it what are our possibilities what kind of I think we have to rethink our entire understanding of agriculture and what we are doing one thing we need to do is to desperately increase the amount of food crop area and food crop cultivation the second thing we need to do the second thing we need to and this I have a hard time talking to my leftist progressive friends who are farmers to delink yourself from the high input high cost economy hmm? the way we are using in this country fertilizer and pesticide we are doomed I would I will I would give an example that dr. Srinivas as a as a medical doctor might agree with we are running agriculture on steroids we are running agriculture on steroids you know all these cheating sports cheating sports athletes they win races by using steroids please look at those athletes 10 years later when they're dying look at them 10 years later when their bodies have collapsed I you know there's a let me give you an example suppose we take two identical brothers we take two identical brothers twins identical height size weight health very healthy both of them excellent uh, physique both of them are doing the same work in agriculture or whatever let us decide that one brother will continue to eat the normal diet which his society has evolved over 2000 years and the other brother we will pump him with steroids he will eat steroid supplements only in the first five years the brother consuming steroids will outperform his twin brother on every parameter at the end of 10 years the non steroids brother will be alive he will still be eating his good food the steroid brother who did heroics for five years will be dead we are running agriculture on steroids we need to move away from extremely dangerous technologies and by the way you know when we criticize this people say are you anti-science the basis of science is skepticism and inquiry the basis of science is that verification the basis of science is that you have to prove what you have to say okay you have to have you have to show me where where your benefits are 
and you have to tell me what the hidden costs are all these things and many people don't understand the difference between science and technology much of what we criticize are technologies applications of science over there hmm? so these are we need to lower the cost of cultivation or your peasant farmer cannot survive india will one day be ruled by corporations like united states agriculture in usa the small farmer is almost extinct the census does not have a separate category for farmer the last united states census does not have category farmer if you are a farmer you have to go online you have to go to the category marked others and in that you have to enter farmer there is no the actual category farmer has been removed from the census because less than 1% of the population is today on agriculture when you have 53% engaged with agriculture dependent on it in one way or the other where will they go what will they do we have had already the biggest migrations as the census shows you for the first time in your history urban population added more people than the rural population first time in your history the last time it happened was in independent india the last time it happened was in 1921 after the influenza epidemic and plague this is the first time in independent history even in the partition this did not happen that the urban population went up higher than the rural population first time in 60 years it shows you that the countryside is in a state of collapse but you can do a lot of things there are many things we can do one is to, you have to understand this if you are fighting for a democracy which i assume you are if you are fighting for a just and humane society which i assume you are if you are fighting for a society which has which places the human being at the center but also at a responsible center that looks at environment and ecology and what's happening to the planet which i assume you are then you will find that you are fighting corporate power you will find that you are fighting monopoly power when three companies control seed four companies control fertilizer five companies control pesticide and hundreds of millions of 1 billion human beings are dependent on them you will be fighting corporate power there is no option what has happened in agriculture is the extreme version of what has happened in the rest of the society in growing inequality okay in growing inequality 64 years ago you're seeing the results of the inequality around you every single day while covering the drought this year in marathwada i was looking at people trying to get 20 liters of water per day and in the same western maharashtra there are huge advertisement hoardings saying luxury flats 12 story building private swimming pool with each flat many buildings have come up in maharashtra like that every floor is one flat 6000 square feet 9000 square feet with a private swimming pool while people are dying for water in agriculture what are we growing in maharashtra two thirds of our sugar cane is grown in drought prone areas do you know how much water one acre of sugar cane takes 18 million liters do you know how much 18 million liters is seven and a half olympic swimming pools for one acre of sugar cane then where is the water for going food crop you must we, we have to arrive at some balance one more demand that i've been making repeatedly is parliament should have a special 10 day session just to discuss agriculture and the future of agriculture in this country what kind of agriculture we should go for how we should solve the agrarian crisis dr m s swaminathan was an mp in raj sabha for 6 years the poor man tried his best and failed to bring us bill on special entitlements of women farmers he drafted the bill himself he could not move it as a private members bill nobody was interested i mean the major parties were not interested so it could not be done i am saying we need a whole session of parliament where you will have to talk about agriculture and nothing but agriculture i am saying that we have to oppose corporate power and fight it where we find it we have to oppose monopoly power and fight it where we find it 
there are two things that I'll leave you with. One, in 1948, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, on drafting the constitution, as handing over the draft to the members of the new constituent assembly, made a profound prophecy, which I think is the greatest speech ever made on inequality in this country. Ambedkar said, we are now entering an era of paradox and contradictions. On, one si on the one hand, we have built a beautiful political democracy. But in society and economy, there is no democracy. There is sheer inequality. And one day, the contradictions between the inequality in the society and economy and the political democracy will lead to the explosion of political democracy. How true those words are when you're looking at the resistance of peasants to the grabbing of their lands, when you're looking at POSCO, when you're looking at Polavaram, when you're looking at Vedam, Vedanta and Niyamgiri. Look at, look at those. But the important thing is that people are fighting. So there is hope. People ask me, are you optimistic or are you, sin are you pessimistic? I will say this. I always give this answer. Between fake optimism, there is a fake optimism which says everything is wonderful, it's getting better. That absolves me of the responsibility of doing anything. And there is cynical pessimism which says, Kuch sudrega nahi, so why should I do anything? Between fake optimism and cynical pessimism, there is a territory called hope. I live there. Okay? And that hope that I experience comes from watching people fight unbelievable odds, unbelievable circumstances, like the tribals and Adivasis of Niamgiri have fought and preserved their land. Like the two villages of Posco have re resisted and held out against the entire might of the Indian state. These people give you hope. Yet, on the other side, there is the tragedy. In the 60s and 70s, we had mass farmers movements for land reform, for land distribution. We had those move, mass movements. In the 90s and 2000s, we have mass farmers' suicides. That is terrible. We need, to re we need to go back to the era of struggle and fight. And for that, the privileged middle classes have to shed some of the apathy, have to shed their lack of connection with ordinary people. In the Christian Medical College, Vellore, when you join, one of the first things they tell you, in medical terms, they tell you, what the mind does not know, hmm, uh, the, so what the eye does not, what the eye does not observe, the mind cannot know. You know, so if you don't know, if, if you don't know what is, uh, I mean, if your mind does not know, um, if what, what the mind does not know, the eye cannot observe. If, the, if you do not know what is tuberculosis, you are not going to recognize it. You have ended your speech by referring to enlightened wisdom and also pinning hope on the, on, pinning hope on the middle class. Hmm. I find both of them absent in this country. You find? At both of these absent in this country. Absent. Okay. Absent. Take the case of this district. Perhaps the most advanced district in the whole country. Here, the paddy cultivation has come to a standstill. I went on the Okay. This district. Okay. For the past one, one and a half year, I've been living here. Mm. The argument given is there is no labor. They are shipped on to arachnid cultivation, and they also talk about arachnid gives us more income than paddy. So food is being imported, and this also a very highly enlightened district. Okay with lot of modern facilities, but the people of this country, enlightened people, do not share your optimism. 
now the problem sir is hmm. our political parties have failed our newspapers media people have failed you have been doing a lonely battle i know that but yeah i i get the point sir yes. let me let me respond to so your point so now where is the hope then if i have remained 20 years full time as a rural reporter it's because the people of this country give me that hope i see unbelievable struggles against unimaginable odds and it's also in the history and tradition of this country that this country is this can the people of this country brought the mightiest empire in the world to its knees it took it took time however the point you're making about shortage of labor it's a very interesting point much of the labor has fled to the towns and the cities in exodus migrations in farmers have become agricultural laborers but people are not willing to pay a higher wage and a higher price so that person from odisha who will not get that amount in nregs he will not get that amount in the field work he has every right to go and work in a bar in kerala or mangalore where he will get 200 rupees a day he has a right to look after his family the way i and you have a right to look after our families so for that we also have to create that enabling situation where people remain with agriculture or some people remain with agriculture i find i have seen i have been witness to astonishing astonishing experiments in this country and struggles in this ex- i watched posco for the last 10 years have written about it that spirit of those people is indomitable okay i said middle class because this audience is middle class we are all middle class i am you are but if you look at it the adivasis of niamgiri the fighting people of posco many many struggles i've seen across this country where i marvel at the capacity of people to sustain oppression and fight back in your neighboring state i see a women's movement called kudumbashree it is to my mind the most inspiring anti poverty movement in this country that i have seen in my 30 years as a journalist it is controlled by the women on the ground but it is a correct mix it is driven by the public from below but it also has official support state intervention state support in some proportion if uh, 3.7 million women in kerala are involved in kudumbashree quarter of a million have taken up land on lease and are doing collective farming and they are doing fa- they have changed the definition of food security they are no longer talking about food security not even of food sovereignty they are striving for food justice the principle of that farm suppose 18 women are involved in one kudumbashree farming activity the principle is that the output will first be shared by the family only what is left will go to the market okay so there is in this country within your own societies there are people there are more, there is spirit there is that so i haven't given up that hope but let me make this let me concede your point in one thing i think things will get better but i think they will get a lot worse before they get better yeah yes hello yeah uh, you talked about that uh, giggling economist jagdish bhagavadi hmm and at the same time uh, could you not uh, uh, align him with the present prime minister manmohan singh he too is his classmate i think is a uh, classmate of him i think they yeah. are together they go both think that they, they uh, that intrinsic principle is that mm. for the development of a uh, past faced development a large mass of humans ought to perish 
I think uh, that is the way the the the, the, the uh, now saying cliche you know, that the inclusive growth like that he used to always okay. talk about. Yeah, I get the point. Uh, let me let me say something about inclusive growth. Every statement of the government of India says inclusive growth. To me, that is an admission that it has so far been exclusive. If if your growth were inclusive, you wouldn't have to shout inclusive growth, inclusive growth. It's because it is not inclusive. It's because millions of masses are excluded that you have to keep saying inclusive growth. Number one. Number two. The prime minister, as an economist, you know, I don't think after his PhD thesis he published in one single paper. And look, look, the darling of the media for 20 years is now in disgrace. because he is no longer able to deliver to the corporate world what they want he gave them everything but he is no longer able to deliver so today they mock him you know uh, so in fact if you read this prime minister was finance minister in 1991 if i read out that speech to you that he made then when he just when he said we have why we have to go for neoliberal economic reforms if you read that speech all the problems he is claiming about at that time are there today again because they are embedded in that economics the same prime minister 6 months before he became finance minister was chairman of the south commission on global poverty the south commission headed by julius nyerere of tanzania in that report that report is a scathing attack on all these policies and is signed by the gen by the secretary member secretary of the report who signs the report is one sardar manmohan singh 6 months later he has changed all his views the rapidity adaptability is wonderful so quickly he was able to overnight change all his views having mind you that the the report was published after he changed his views which was a huge embarrassment because he changed them so quickly this is the first unelected prime minister in your country's history there is also a lesson for you in that tomorrow they will bring some corporate ceo okay and say let him let him be it will be a wonderful man decisive yeah you have seen how decisive he is and he has been actually i think this prime minister has been very decisive has he not been decisive in giving ambani's whatever they want has he not been decisive in letting the tatas get away with all kinds of you know forestation getting away with what happens in kalinganagar where they took over hundreds and hundreds of acres and didn't build a steel plant for the next 15 years and have now convert 25 villages were damaged five villages were destroyed permanently they never made the steel plant and are today converted it into an scz and are claiming rent on the land of the farmers from other corporations this prime minister is very decisive in allowing all these things to happen no so i'm saying that the whole concept of growth is very flawed in the sense that the growth doesn't matter unless what the growth achieves matters okay if growth achieves higher living standards if growth achieves higher safe environmental situation if growth achieves food nutrition and health justice that's growth that matters growth that simply adds to the profits of corporations and higher salaries in the service sector you know the american ecologist edward abbey summed it up beautifully in 1980 he said of that kind of growth growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell the cancer cell keeps growing that is the kind of growth we have opted for the only growth that will be sustainable is growth through justice that the millions of hundreds of millions in this country await that justice if your growth comes through them you know then you will see like for instance where you did in those areas where you did land reform you saw the highest productivity in farming you saw the highest growth rate in the production of rice in those areas that had land reform because then the small holder of the land the small 
got a title to the land was able to it, it means much more to me if it's my land that I am investing in now you'll again have to go to yet another phase which the women of Kudumbashri are doing they don't own the land they're leasing but they're acting as a collective they're using their collective strength and that ultimately is the strength of the masses the growth pattern of today is unsustainable terribly dangerous and it's just meaningless numbers beyond a point but governments of India exist only to show growth figures not figures in health not figures in education or literacy but that's the problem yeah 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 uh, this uh, Sharad Pawar hmm. was the agriculture minister for almost 10 years now he's a man known to have double speak like you know he thinks he talks about being concerned about farmers which he isn't at all hmm. and uh, he bats for uh, BT cotton he bats for uh, sugar lobby and then our media is very quiet and uh, you know he's a holy cow for the media I don't know why for all these years there isn't a paper wrote anything about him I have I have for 28 years written but, about him and I have never written a kind word about him but sir P. Uh, P. Sainath is a lone figure at the moment there should be hundreds of P. Sainaths in the whole of all of this country think, in the I media are, it isn't think, happening I think there are hundreds I don't think they have the space and the freedom in their newspapers and channels well, but, that is, that but there is, is another thing. But le I'll let you complete your question, then I'll answer. No, no, it's the same thing that we need to write about such people in the political arena who do not represent the masses and yet they are voted for, uh, into power year after year after year because yeah. media tell, tells nothing about it. Maybe, yes, okay. P. Sainath has said somewhere, okay. but then it has not percolated down. He's, it's a minor, uh, yeah, thank you. It's a minor improvement on the Prime Minister that this man is elected. Prime Minister is not even elected. Hmm. Now, Mr. Pawar, I have covered him as a reporter for 28 years. Okay? Uh, Mr. Sh Sharad Pawar, as Agriculture Prime Minister, has presided over two-thirds of the farm suicides that have occurred in this country's history. Okay? As Chief Minister of Maharashtra, Maharashtra is the worst state in the farm suicides with 57,373 suicides. Everything in his record is terrible, but he serves the interest of the corporate world and the media are owned by and run by the corporate world. Have you seen the number of editorials in the last few days saying, go ahead with GM crops? Hmm. Do you know the story behind it? First, Jairam Ramesh appoint, asked senior scientists from across the world to look at the BT Brinjal issue. He was advised against it and he refused to let. He put a blanket moratorium on BT Brinjal. He did it democratically, also wrote to all the states of the country. Except for Gujarat, all the other states said no. Kerala asked for a 50-year moratorium. Okay. Then the newspapers attacked it, said it's a political decision, blah, 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 blah. Then, then, the Sopori committee went into it. That is a scientist. It said the same thing. Don't go, don't get into this now. Media kept quiet. Then, parliamentary standing committee came, I, I took them in Vidarbha to several villages. It's a unique parliamentary standing committee. It was headed by Basude Bacharya of the CPM. There were members of 10 parties, 10 party members uh, were in the standing committee that came to Vidarbha. JD, JDU, um, Congress, BJP, Shiva Sena, CPM, and uh, S Samajwadi Party and BSP also. I also appeared before the Parliamentary Standing Committee in Parliament where members from, th there were 32 members from, you know, some 16 parties or something. They went around the country, saw the areas with, where this miracle BT had come and for the first time I think in the history of this country's Parliament, they gave a 470 page report, unanimous, without one line of dissent, 
Even the Congress party's official spokesperson signed that report saying moratorium on BT, on trials, on field trials, moratorium on field trials. Have you ever heard of Indian Parliament, a committee that is unanimous without one line of dissent across 400 pages? Hmm? Then they were roundly attacked in the media and the media editorial said, these are not scientists. These are all bloody politicians. Nine, Ninety percent of those politicians were farmers and were from the countryside. That's why they were on the Agriculture Standing Committee. Okay. These are not scientists. They were, they were political people and they were farmers. But, okay. Then Aruna Rodriguez, a, an activist on the issue, she filed a PIL in the Supreme Court. And Supreme Court appointed a technical expert committee. Some of the country's finest scientists, like Imran Siddiqui, of that center in Hyderabad, microbiology, all the top scientists they could get were appointed. Five top scientists were appointed. Now this time it's not politicians. It is people who are heading science institutions, head of the life sciences of JNU, all top scientists. They gave a unanimous report saying moratorium on GM trials. Now the papers couldn't attack it anymore. They, you said these are not uh, these, po these are politicians. These are not scientists. Now the country's top scientists are saying don't do it. What do you say? You say go ahead. You write editorials dismissing their report. Meanwhile, when they first gave their report, agriculture ministry protested like anything that other voices should also be heard. So then the court said, okay, one representative from agriculture ministry can come. Agriculture ministry did not appoint a representative of its own. It appointed a corporate man. It appointed a man called Paroda, who is, whose foundations take money from Monsanto and Cargill. Huh? They from Monsanto, certainly. So they appoint this man. He doesn't attend meetings. He doesn't sign that report. Yeah. They send him messages, they ask him to come and participate. He can't stand up to those scientists because he is not anywhere in their domain or in their level, in their league. So the scientists have been told your report is an interim report. You take his inputs and give a final report, which was a very bad decision of the Supreme Court. But anyway, again the scientists came back with the report unanimous because Paroda did not write a letter of dissent. Now he is bringing out his own report. Because he is wiser than all the top scientists. Huh? First of all, look at the fact that Sharad Pawar's agriculture ministry appoints a corporate fellow, a fellow who was an ex-ICAR man, but completely a corporate consultant since then, and he is appointed as the agriculture ministry's expert. In other words, he is, respect, he is representing you and me. He is representing the public interest. This sort of racketeering, that the whole talk today was about corporatization of agriculture. How corporates have hijacked, this is how they have hijacked agriculture. So that is the record of Mr. Pawar. After all this, he is still saying it. The Parliamentary Standing Committee was unanimous. The Scientist Technical Expert Committee was unanimous. The Brinjal, BT Brinjal Committee which went into it, they were unanimous. But still, the corporate media will push for it. Now Mr. Pawar, you know, there was a wonderful time in Maharashtra at the height of the suicides when uh, agriculture minister was Pawar, chief minister was Vilasrao Deshmukh, another fellow whom I covered for 25 years, and governor was S.M. Krishna. Look at the fate of Maharashtra. Mr. S.M. Krishna was spent twice the number of days in Bangalore that he did in Mumbai. In fact, he was Jet Airways' most frequent flyer. Hmm. So we had a situation where we had a Rajapal, a governor whose interest was the neighboring state, a chief minister whose interest was real estate, and a Krishi Mantri, who in Vidarbha they call Cricket Mantri. That is the story. But Mr. Pawar has huge influence in the media. Mr. Pawar has never, contrary to all beliefs about his greatness, he has never led a political party to victory in assembly on his own. He has never done it. 
He has always been chief minister by defections and splitting. He has never, the great Maratha has never led a political party in Maharashtra to victory. People like Vasant Dada Patil, who was really a great Maratha, used to defeat him and rub him in the ground. Hmm. But one place Mr. Pawar had three-fourths majority, chief reporters of newspapers. Don't ask me why. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Let him let him ask and then I'll I'll take you. Yeah. Sir, uh, uh, agriculture has been hijacked by corporates. Parliament has been hijacked by corporates. Then how the middle class who do not go for even voting, how these things can be improved? You know, I'm not, I'm not uh, I'm, I'm saying I'm not saying that the middle class will rescue anything. I'm saying. The battles against corporates, you should join them. It's in your interest to do that, is what I'm saying. I don't, by the way, I never use the word, in India, I don't believe there is a middle class. I believe there are middle classes, in plural. The vice chancellor of the university is middle class. The vice chancellor's driver is also middle class. The vice chancellor's driver in JNU earns 22 or 24,000 rupees a month. In India, that is middle class. But his lifestyle is entirely different from that of, and social circuit is entirely different from that of the vice chancellor, who also calls himself middle class. So in India we have middle classes. It's not a homogeneous body like the western middle class. Correct? So then, what, what, uh, you're, you're making my point. Parliament is being hijacked by corporations. Media have been hijacked by corporations. That's why I said, if you decide to fight this situation, you are fighting corporate power. That is what you are fighting. That is what you are fighting. I am also saying that you have no choice. You have no choice. Either you are a part of the problem or a part of the solution. Now some of us, there are some of us whom we can call the comfortable middle classes. We will yell and shout and show drawing room outrage, but we are quite happy to let things be as they are. We will shout about corruption, right? About individual corruption of the railway clerk or the tehsildar, which is an issue. I agree. But we are not talking. Here, the policy is the corruption. The policy is the corruption. The entire package of neoliberal economics is a corruption of human decency. Okay? The entire, the 2G scam did not occur by stealth. It occurred by policy. It occurred by policy decisions. Now they are mortgaging your banks. Okay? We are on our way to getting rid of the public sector banks, destroying them. So the fight against this is a fight against corporate power. My point is that many sections of the middle classes will be very foolish if they think they will be better off under a corporate state. They are very foolish. They are making a serious serious error of judgment which they will live to regret, I hope. Yes? Uh, this is just in continuation of what you have said just now. Now as I understand, uh, the importance that the corporate sector enjoys in this country is somewhere linked to the developmental strategy that we are following. And that developmental strategy is, very, is rooted in the, neo in the neoliberal kind of you know, uh, you know, framework. Now in that kind of you know, situation, the kind of things that you are actually mentioning is bound to happen. You know, I think you know, this is very natural of uh, the neoliberal uh, kind of you know, setup. Now the danger with the neoliberal setup is also partly that it also makes large number of you know, people very apathetic. You know, people become you know, very materialistic, very apathetic, very you know, insensitive mm. to you know, what is happening around mm. them. Uh, now when you say that you, know, you have a hope in the people's struggle against you know, the corporatization and its problems, you know, I somewhere also feel, I agree with your framework broadly, but I also somewhere feel that these kind of you know, struggles often tend to become very localized. And even the people living in the same area also become you know, to, so totally insensitive to the you know, actual fights of these people yeah. because they are not directly affected by it. So hardly I see a chance of these local uh, you know, struggles becoming an all-India struggle and then you know, putting up some resistance no, uh, to the let, very let me, strategy here. Okay, let me respond. Let me put it to you another way. I believe, 
and I'll give you examples from all over the world where the middle classes are marching on the streets. Hmm. Let me put it this way. In fact, your, um, the, sorry, the other point was, there were two points. One was uh, about the middle classes and their apathy. Hmm. And two, the neo, yes, of course, the neoliberal strategy is based on three principles which, you know, ascribe supremacy to market over community, all these principles you know. But A, I am arguing that all over the world that is unraveling. It is falling apart. And therefore they will, they will increasingly resort to aggressive, ag aggressive measures and turning democracies into police states. After 2008, after the Wall Street collapse of 2008, Look at what has happened across the world. Today, Greece, Portugal, Spain, those are middle class people on the streets, lost their jobs in millions and marching out and fighting. Okay, so your apathetic middle class, if they don't wake up, they are going to be overtaken by that march of history. Second, look at the last 10 years, there is one zone which I think offers people enormous hope what has happened in Latin America. Nation after nation in much more difficult circumstances has resisted US imperialism, has nationalized resources, whether it is Morales or Korea, uh, whether it is Ecuador or uh, uh, Venezuela, have they not na nationalized, taken over the resources from the multinationals? thrown out the oil companies and reclaimed public property and natural resources and in everywhere they have been winning with thumping victories Hugo Chavez won with 62% of the population voting for him when Obama won, wins with 28% of the population voting for him and a much fairer election certified by President Jimmy Carter who was the observer he said we can learn from Venezuela on how to conduct a good election. Okay, now Venezuela, Ecuador, Brazil. Brazil was along with India and China and South Africa the most inequality ridden country in the world. But they've done something in the last 10-12 years. And in the process, the masses have become much more aware and conscious. When the Brazilian government did good, they supported it. When they tried changing something in the neoliberal direction, there were street protests of half a million people in Rio and San, and um, you know, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. All across, and by the way, all across Latin America, the fights have been over water, privatization of water. A tiny country like Uruguay has a population of three million gives a lesson to India. Do you know what they did after their 2003 election? The only country in the world held a referendum and then passed a constitutional amendment based on a referendum voted for by more than 90% of the population. It is now in the constitution. Water can never be privatized. I think we have something to learn from them. Hmm. Far less educated people, far less resources than we have. All these, odd, don't you think we have something to learn? Wouldn't you like to see an amendment like that in your constitution? That water and common lands should not be privatized? Right. They've done it. So all over the world people are doing things. People are fighting. I gave you examples from within India. Now I'm giving you examples from Europe. People are fighting. In the United States, in the United States in 2011-12, what was the most famous movement? Occupy Wall Street. Do you know that similar imitator movements came up in 450 towns across USA as people went into public properties and occupied them and said you cannot privatize, you cannot do this. There was Occupy Austin, Occupy Georgia. Occup Occupy Georgia there was a, an ex-police chief, a woman, a woman police chief whose home was being forfeited in a bad mortgage. Occupy Georgia, she became the symbol of the movement in, that, in Georgia, Atlanta, 
because all the occupied squatters went and sat to defend the house of the police chief. She was dying of cancer. She had retired, taken premature retirement. All over the world, people have fought back. That gives me hope. People are fighting. They're for me, it's not just the victory and the, the very process of struggle gives me hope. I will be very frightened. Why, why do I take the farm suicide so seriously? Because suicide is the end of hope. In suicide there is no struggle. Suicide is a surrender. Where I see struggle, I'm hopeful. Where people fight, I'm hopeful. And I've seen that the people of this country are not less than anyone. Now the other point I want to make to you about local, global and national. It has been my argument for the last 20 years that the opposition to what we call globalization will be intensely local. It is the closure of the school in your locality. It is the closure of the factory in mine. It is the closure, it is the privatization of water in his locality. That is what brings people to the streets. The opposition to globalization, because neoliberal globalization, because that is so predatory, will be local. It is destroying local communities. So the resistance will be local. The challenge before us is how we unite those million mutinies and battles. How do we do that? Occupy, has, Occupy will dissolve, but the spirit started by Occupy Wall Street is continuing in the United States in various ways. Okay? They are facing tremendous police repression. Tremendous police repression. They are all getting police records, professors of universities. They have never had a parking ticket also, but they are being punished. But everywhere people, it inspired something. Then you had Occupy, Occupy uh, in Europe, you had Occupy movements in Greece, when the entire national property was mortgaged to the European bank. I had asked in 2006 when the Kisan Sabha's conference took place in Nashik, long before Occupy movement in, in USA, I had argued no more taking rallies to Red Fort where newspapers and television will not even bother to send a reporter because the police, I said let us take every farmer we can gather in this country and occupy Delhi. Then. The Prime Minister will come to you. You don't have to go in a delegation to the Prime Minister. The way ahead is struggle. Yeah, there was a question here. Yeah, well, what do you think about this concept of direct payment of subsidy? Do you think it's a right step in the right direction? Okay. Hmm. I think this you are looking at one of the biggest scams that is going to explode. Hmm? Now, let me say this. I am not opposed to every direct cash transfer. If you are a student on scholarship, I support your getting direct cash transfer. If you are a pensioner, I support your getting direct cash transfer. Okay, you are an educated person, you are in a particular groove of society and you have a bank account, etc. What the government of India is trying to do is very different. It is trying to do direct cash transfers on agriculture. It is trying to do direct benefit transfers. Now here is the problem. Huh? You are going to have direct cash transfer in a country, 60% of the population do not have bank accounts. So who will you transfer the money to? To yourself. 60, according to the outgoing RBI governor, Subbarao, 60% of Indians do not have bank accounts, A. B. Many, another percentage within that is what he calls redundant accounts. They're meaningless accounts. They're just there, naam ke vaste. They don't mean anything. And see, there is another set of accounts which are suspicious accounts. You know, they may be innocent, but they're suspect in law. Okay. So really, look, see, we boast as a nation. Census shows 53% of Indians have cell phones. 60% of them don't have bank accounts and 67% of rural Indians don't have toilets. So let's not be too celebratory about the cell phone, which is a wonderful instrument in its own way. I don't deny that. But 
That is the fact of life. Now, when 60% of your population, now that 60% of your population that doesn't have bank accounts, they are the ones requiring subsidy, God damn it. We are doing, uh, let me make one, let me make one honest admission. I am not questioning this government's ability to do direct cash transfers because this government of India has shown that it is brilliant at large scale cash transfers to its own ministers. Right? In that, you can look at the Prime Minister's website and see the rise in assets of each minister. In 27 months, in 24 to 27 months as a minister, Mr. Praful Patel increased his assets by 44 crores. That means every, every, what, every month, every day, he added 500,000 rupees. Every day he added half a million rupees. What a direct cash transfer. Hmm. Now, first, you are trying to transfer money to people who don't have bank accounts. You know what will happen. Second, every government in this country, huh, on the one hand, you are promoting, what, does, what do governments do? They promote consumption of alcohol, correct? Every government, state government, earns a lot of money from excise. The collectors and district collectors have targets for Indian manufactured liquor. For I don't know the state, I don't know the status in Karnataka. Is it any different? Government makes major revenue from sale of liquor. Now we are making major revenue of sale of liquor and then you are sending cash transfer to that household, the number of men beating up their wives will grow to take that money for alcohol, for gambling. Hmm. You are in fact aiding and abetting domestic violence. I am not joking. If alcoholism, which is a serious problem, as I said, as I said, it's not only farmers, journalists also. Okay. If alcohol, which is a serious problem, you are transferring cash into the household in the name of giving direct cash transfer to the woman. As it is, you know, in microcredit, how many husbands have taken loans in the name of the wife? And the wife is held responsible for that, for that loan. Okay. Look at the domestic situation you are creating. How much? Because, on the one hand, you are giving direct cash transfer for food. Hmm? On the other hand, you are advertising outside that fellow's house to come and buy liquor from your stand. Government approved stand. So you know where your direct cash... Direct cash transfer will work under circumstances where the other basics are in place. Now when you make a direct cash transfer for a scholarship to a student, if he is a student, he is a student, he is in a college, it is verifiable, he has got a bank account, he is going to the course, you can verify whether he is attending the course or he has dropped out. You have means of verification, all the basics are in place, then you can do the direct cash transfer. Can you do that for purchase of fertilizer and know that they will purchase fertilizer? What do you think? What do you think? Do you see the dangers involved? And on top of that you brought this wonderful thing called Aadhaar. 10% failure rate in its, in its, uh, in Godavari district where they are trying it. See, one of the huge biometric systems of this kind, of the others, they have failed all around the world. UK spent millions of pounds, Britain, and before they completed quarter of the project, they scrapped it. Australia started the project, they scrapped it. In India, we will give it, by the way, the original budget was 6,000 crores, they have spent more than 15,000 crores. They have not covered even quarter of the population. Hmm? It is a great subsidy for your IT industry. And here's another thing. The failure rate on fingerprint in India is very high. Let me, let me explain. In any society in the world, in any society in the world, 7% failure rate in printing, in, meaning 7% of the population don't fingerprint properly. In India, that is 15% and above because of agricultural laborers, the implements they use, the work they use, their fingers don't fingerprint. Those are the people who need your damn subsidy the most. Those are the people who need your transfers the most. They can't do other properly. 
because their fingerprints will bo boomerang. Have you ever seen the fingers of a agricultural laborer, the hand of the agricultural laborer? See, the highest failure rate will be there amongst the people who need the subsidies most. Not corporate executives, agricultural laborers. So there are huge numbers of problems with that. If you have the basics in place, like you are a pensioner, I mean, you're too young to be, but suppose you are a pensioner, we know where you were working, you are on a database, you have got a bank account, you had an office where you used to work, there are all sorts of records, multiple records on you already. Direct cash transfer there is okay, because the basics are in place. But if you give for schooling, will that child go to school? Or will the father go to the Arak shop? Think, think about those things also. I can't hear you. I feel strongly that agriculture as a profession hmm. has become, it is not viable. It is not becoming sustainable. Hmm. Because coming from the village background, I feel again that not many people in the villages itself, they yeah. are not cultivating. True. No, in fact, due to several reasons, cost of labourer and all that, mm. that's a different story. But one point I would like to highlight, Karnataka State Riot Association, former President Professor Nanjun Swami used to say, now we are talking of one, what is the cost of production of a product, paddy, per one quintal. We have to take into account about minimum four to five months duration crop. Or if it is a sugar cane, it is 14 months uh, period. Then about all other things. So, if you take your own hard labor, that is the farmer and his wife or whatever, mm. I don't think they will get anything. Yeah. It is a real Correct. big zero. Correct. These days are very marginal, if at all something. Correct. Then how can we continue with oh, the agriculture? I'll, I'll explain. I'm saying this, it is absolutely true and in fact, the national sample survey surveys show us, NSS surveys show us that 40% of people in agriculture want to quit agriculture. I think that if you do that survey, in people below the age of 30, it will go to 80%. Hmm. Because we have made agriculture unviable by policy, by design. We have destroyed agriculture of the smallholder because we are trying to bring the agriculture of corporate world into control. That is the reason. We have made their lives unbearable. Therefore, they want to leave agriculture. I don't blame them one bit. But please note that the National Commission of Farmers has given one of its prescriptions is taking into account family labor everything full cost of production COP2 it is called co full cost of production plus 50 percent that is the recommendation and coming back to Mr. Sharad Pawar the National Commission on Farmers gave its recommendations and four volumes in 2007 to this day this Minister of Agriculture has not allowed a discussion on Parliament in that. Okay? So there are solutions, there are ways out. And everybody can't stay in agriculture and everybody doesn't want to stay in agriculture. But what alternatives have we given them? What options have we given them? To come and be your servant or my servant in the city. My, the woman who cleans our house in, in, in Bombay, she is a farmer from Talegaon and Pune. Farming is unviable for her, she's come. She goes back at harvest time and sowing time and brings us brown rice every season as a gift. So...